Uh, so I think we will get started. Um, my name is Zach Doblebauer. I am the Energy and Sustainability Program Manager for the DC Department of General Services. Uh, I would qualify uh, ourselves as uh, the smaller brother or sibling of the federal GSA. We do a lot of the same work. We're responsible for the district's public buildings. We have about 567 of those, which represents about uh, 32 million square feet. Uh, I'm responsible for managing, measuring, and monitoring the resources and commodities that go into operating our facilities, uh, as well as reducing the impact uh, that that resource consumption uh, causes. Uh, I'm excited to be here in the uh, Reagan building this morning, uh, discussing what is uh, effectively the holy grail of our energy and climate quest. Um, Realizing deep energy efficiency in our existing building stock is one of the most important things uh, that we can do to address our challenges today. Uh, I want to thank Core Advisors uh, and the Downtown Bid for hosting this terrific event. Uh, I want to thank you all in the audience, uh, and I want to thank our panelists, uh, who I will introduce uh, very briefly uh, in just a moment. In 2004, I saw President Reagan lying in state. Uh, it was a very impactful uh, event that, that I went to. Uh, I think that he would be proud of, of the work that we're doing today and the, the, the efforts that we're talking about uh, at the DC Energy Summit, uh, conserving resources, saving money, um, producing jobs, transforming markets, uh, and actually also uh, saving the climate. Uh, I don't know if you recall, uh, but one of uh, President Reagan's uh, big challenges was a hole in the ozone. And uh, he addressed that problem through science, uh, data, and a cost-benefit analysis that largely weighed not taking action uh, against removing and avoiding cancers that would have otherwise occurred. And so he did a cost-benefit analysis that made the issue pretty clear as to what the choice was, uh, which was to remove the uh, ozone depleting chemicals. Uh, and it's, this is the same cost benefit analysis that really drives energy efficiency retrofits. Today, the big four accounting firms, experts in measurement, data, analysis, reporting, and monitoring uh, for uh, requirements uh, on how industries and corporations account for social and climate impacts in 2014. They set higher standards for sustainability accounting and reporting, demonstrated the folly of not measuring or not taking into account externalities, and argued for new approaches for assurances of integrated environmental, social, and economic reporting. This year, earlier this year, in 2015 in January, uh, the Climate Disclosure Standards Board released its climate change reporting requirements for adoption by stock exchanges around the world, many of which are already doing this. For the third quadrennial uh, defense review in a row, a strategic document that lays out the risks uh, associated with our military around the world uh, took on, uh, the Department of Defense took on climate change uh, in very sober terms, saying that, expect, that we expect climate change to exacerbate existing tensions, trigger resource conflicts, uh, and put DOD facilities and preparedness at risk. As greenhouse gas emissions increase, sea levels are rising, average global temperatures are increasing, and severe weather patterns are accelerating. Not long ago, in the span of about a week, the District of Columbia met with Bob Inglis, a conservative leader and former Republican congressman, and a leading nas national environmental group to discuss a carbon tax. Uh, it's their belief that uh, a market-based approach and a price on carbon is the best, fastest way to reduce emissions and mitigate climate disruption. McKinsey and Company, in what is now a, a relatively famous uh, cost abatement curve, defined efficiency as the single most cost effective solution to reducing climate risk and climate mitigation. To understand that these very serious and major institutions are no longer talking about climate change uh, and instead reacting to our disruptive climate, with new tools and new methods is to understand that we need major solutions and massive action quick. 
Deep energy retrofits are just that. Uh, and this is why I'm excited to, to introduce our panel today uh, to talk about this subject. Uh, these folks and, and their agencies and their, their company are out there implementing energy efficiency <coughs> on a massive scale from policy to implementation to the finance and procurement tools to technologies that make it work. Deep, ener deep energy retrofits are here and now. Uh, and so with that, uh, I will introduce uh, our panelists. We have uh, Kevin Campshire, Federal Director, uh, High Performance Buildings for the U.S. General Services Administration. Kinga Porst, uh, Sustainability Program Advisor for the U.S. General Services Administration. And Harry Sim, CEO uh, of Cypress and Viro Systems. And so they're going to take a look at deep energy retrofits from a holistic level, uh, looking at the policy, uh, what it is, to the tools for implementation, the procurement and finance, uh, down to the actual technology uh, that helps implement uh, these deep energy retrofits and makes them uh, real and accountable uh, and something that we can measure and, and take on. So with that, Kevin. Thank you. I'm glad you did all that. Yes. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for being here at the furthest away room. <laughs> So you got your exercise in, as they say, sitting is the new smoking. So um, we're from GSA, just take his statistics, multiply by 10, and you have all of the uh, relevant information. Um, the interesting thing, I think, though, about GSA is that we operate on a business footing. We collect rent from the tenants. We have to pay all of our expenses out that. We have to deliver a, a profit to our board of directors, the 535 people that you reelect every two years or so. Um, and then that, that money is allocated in some cases back into the inventory, but in some cases it goes off into wherever profits go. Um, it makes us think about everything we do uh, from a business point of view. And I think that that's what we're really going to uh, talk about uh, today. Um, and we're also going to talk about sort of the crossing over of the curves here. The uh, dotted line shows where uh, we are supposed to be headed by law uh, in the uh, federal government as a whole. And as you can see, uh, we, the, the slope of the black line, which is the entire federal government and how much it's doing in terms of a 3 percent per year energy reduction uh, target in energy in, uh, efficiency, I mean intensity, is not quite uh, getting there. So the question is, what can we do to steepen the downward slope of that curve? And I think we have at least one piece of an answer. Here within GSA, you can see we're doing a little bit better than the federal government as a whole. But even so, uh, we've crossed over the line here a little bit uh, on, on the wrong side. Now, we think we're actually going to be back down right below 30 percent by the end of the year. Uh, but it's going to take a significant amount of work. How do you get that work done? Is it capital intensive? Can you actually bring other techniques to bear in deep energy retrofits? And it's worth talking a little bit about net zero. Uh, my old boss, Dorothy Robine, said that um, the only thing you know about a goal of zero is that it's the wrong goal. Uh, because it should probably be tailored for every building, and maybe in some buildings the, it should be a net plus. You know, we should be generating en energy. And in fact, there are military bases right now that are headed that way uh, to provide, uh, as, as you mentioned earlier, Zach, uh, uh, greater um, resiliency for the military forces there, and we're, we're getting there. Um, but we've also got within GSA's own inventory uh, an example uh, with an absolutely zero dollar added budget for repair and renovation, a, a net zero facility that we did under the Recovery Act in Grand Junction, Colorado. No extra cost just by thinking about things as uh, several people on the panel uh, this morning set, said as an integrated system, which means that you don't start uh, with uh, thinking about the individual components, but you think about the entire building system and how it works. And in order to do that, you really have to say, 
where's the energy going today? How, are, how am I going to get it uh, as low as possible? The first net zero building in the federal government was the um, research support facility in Golden, Colorado, the Department of the Energy, part of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory there. And the uh, director set a uh, uh, EUI target of, for that building of 20,000 uh, BTUs per square foot per year and asked at the end what he would do differently. He said, I didn't set the goal low enough. I would do it at 10 or 12 now because it's achievable. And by the way, that's with a big data center in the building. And they're below, they're closer to 15,000 right now. And that's a regular office building. It's not a laboratory, but it's got a significant uh, amount of uh, computing power in there because that's the way they do that. And sort of thinking about this, then how do you actually do it? And you notice that it's, you know, eat your energy efficiency vegetables before you get your uh, solar dessert. And that's the sort of the thinking that, that we uh, think is necessary for deep energy retrofits. We believe, and I think uh, Kinga will be talking shortly, uh, we have proved that 50% energy savings in buildings are achievable with normal budgets and good thinking. Um, you need an integrative design and analysis process. You need to really work about the project economics. You need to think about the short term and the long term simultaneously. And there's value beyond the energy saving, cost savings of what you're doing in the building. If you think, for example, about one technology, the windows, changing the value proposition of the building so that it actually can modulate the daylight, address the glare, and provide you the energy savings of a better performing window is value beyond the cost savings. One example, there are many, many others. And there, in, in the net, and we talked about this this morning, you know, the overall health of the grid is a positive electric, electricity system impact of doing this overall because, you know, it's a lot less expensive to do some energy efficiency in a bunch of buildings than to build a new coal-fired plant to deliver electricity to those buildings. Uh, and, but you have to do it as a holistic system. And again, this idea of integrated thinking and systems thinking is all, uh, uh, all what we think is really essential for getting this uh, going. We uh, sort of took after this idea of deep energy retrofits it, within the construct of can we do a net zero building using an energy savings performance contract. Now, um, the value that most people talk about in an energy savings performance contract is somebody else comes in with their money, makes the capital improvements to your building, and then you pay them with the savings in the energy bill, uh, and then after they're paid back, uh, you pocket the savings. That's true. That is a component of it. That, to me, is far from the most important thing. The most important thing, and again, the panel talked about that, how do you guarantee the performance? Well, this is a performance contract with guaranteed performance. And we believe that it includes the behavior of the tenants in there. We don't think that you, ha you can possibly ignore that. And it doesn't matter whether those tenants are computers or data servers or people. It's all about the integration of all of those things. If you look at what's happened to buildings in the United States since 1985, um, in 1985, tenants basically controlled and, and affected about 10% of the electrical consumption of buildings. Today, it's between 45 and 50%. What's happened is two things, the curves have crossed. Building systems have become much more efficient, and there's this little thing called the personal computer that didn't exist in most office buildings in 1985. They're everywhere in three screens. You know, talk about that. You have to integrate all of that thinking. So we approached the um, energy savings uh, community, the uh, ESCOs, uh, at the very beginning of our process and said, what are the barriers to actually getting to deep energy retrofit, doing it faster, and, and getting to a net zero building? Now, we talk about deep energy retrofit because in most cases, 
we've discovered that, you know, net zero may be not quite possible, but nevertheless, you can get very, very close. But, and the answer from every single one of the 16 companies we approached was really simple. It's the government. We go into the negotiation. You guys are risk averse. You don't want to do the modern technologies. It's you guys are the problem. So, of course, I went to all of the, and we did this charrette, by the way, with the Rocky Mountain Institute. So it's not just, you know, our perception. So we went to a bunch of contracting officers and project managers in the government and asked them the same question. And they gave the exact same answer. It's the energy services companies. They are risk averse. They don't propose new technologies, and they take forever to do their analysis. So that's what spawned the charrette. We said, we're going to put these people in the same room, and we're going to figure out why uh, the, 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 the salute shouldn't look like this, you know? It's not me. Um, and this is, this is where we come in. Two days, charrette in, uh, in uh, Colorado. Um, what is it that we can do differently? And the number one thing, and I think this is uh, important to know, is that Benjamin Franklin was right. Time is money. Every single day we spend dithering or talking about something rather than doing it is something that we don't get to do because you have to pay for that overhead in the course of this process. And it doesn't matter whether it's the company or the uh, uh, or, the, um, or, the, or the government who's doing it in this kind of thing, or the building owner. And, and this is the exact same thing that uh, Tony Malkin uh, discovered in the uh, Empire State Building. It's like all of that study part up front has to get paid for in one point or another, and the more you pay for thinking, the less you actually get back in energy savings. Um, other things are obviously the, the points I've been making before about integrated thinking, making sure that occupant behavior is on the table, making sure that building management behavior is on the table. Uh, every single panelist this morning mentioned that uh, the building operations are a prime opportunity for anybody in this business. Uh, in fact, a colleague of mine at Heinz says that they can take over any building operated by anybody and take 15% off the energy bill with zero capital just by training people how to operate the building better. So, with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Kinga Porst, who has been managing this program for GSA, and she will tell you the good news. Yes, you can do it, and no, it's not easy, but it's very achievable. Thank you, Kevin, and uh, yes, I will uh, uh, talk about the um, possibility of uh, getting these deep energy retrofits done. Uh, <clears throat> and I'll talk about some of the case studies and, in fact, uh, achieving net zero with uh, uh, the energy savings performance contracts without uh, using appropriated funding is achievable as well. So what we discovered is that uh, there are really no technical barriers. Uh, every building can be a good candidate for deep energy retrofits. When we talk about deep energy retrofits, we there's no official definition, but it's typically um, retrofits that are achieving 50% or more. But as Kevin said, every building is different. So in some cases, a 30, 40% reduction would be just as big of an achievement in a particular building um, th that would qualify for a deep energy retrofit. Um, our problem was really the lack of um, appropriated funding. So. Um, we are using third-party financing. There are different vehicles the government uh, uh, is authorized to use, energy savings performance contracts or utility energy savings uh, contracts or um, uh, power purchase agreements. There are various ways we can uh, fund these projects. Um, I think most of you are uh, familiar with energy savings performance contracts, and Kevin uh, explained how uh, the revenue flows and the energy savings companies guarantee these uh, uh, project performances. So essentially, um, it's a budget neutral uh, project for the government because uh, our utility bills get um, reduced uh, after the improvements are implemented in the buildings, and we use those uh, uh, difference to pay off the, the loan uh, over the time of the 
uh, project. So what we um, found is that, as Kevin already uh, talked about, um, key uh, success factors, integrative design, looking at the building as a whole, addressing uh, the building envelope issues, reducing the load, and then with that, maybe get away with smaller uh, chillers or boilers in the building, and then address um, operation and maintenance uh, opportunities in the building, and uh, the occupant engagement uh, is a key piece, uh, and then supplement uh, with renewable energy. In uh, 2012 now, uh, we um, announced the National Deep Energy Retrofit Program, uh, 23 facilities across the country in six regions uh, across GSA, a total of almost 15 million square feet of space. Um, the other thing we heard from the charrette was um, uh, bundling buildings together in one project, basically using savings from one building to maybe supplement uh, um, uh, retrofit needs in another building uh, would be beneficial. So this is how we approached it. And uh, in 2014, at the end of the year, we awarded uh, uh, $172 million uh, worth of contracts. This is uh, 10 different task orders uh, with um, six or eight, six uh, energy savings companies across uh, the country. Uh, the uh, true success was um, the average energy reduction in these uh, uh, projects were 38 um, percent. You might say it's not 50 percent, but uh, it's actually doubling the um, average government-wide um, energy savings from energy savings performance contracts. In the past, these contracts on average were achieving about 18, 19 percent. So with the focused effort and uh, our open communication and uh, eliminating this, um, we were um, able to double this uh, um, savings. And now we'll have a couple of case studies um, um, that will show um, how it can be done in a, in a particular building. Looking at this is just a list of um, energy conservation measures that were implemented in these projects. And if you look at it, there is really no rocket science. I, um, I would have liked to see more uh, really advanced out there technologies, but uh, um, most of these projects included very typical um, lighting upgrades, building automation system replacements, um, chiller boiler replacements, um, roof replacements, uh, and then some uh, solar and uh, geothermal. This is just a, a kind of a plot chart. Uh, the government is tracking all the energy savings performance contracts, and that's part of the uh, presidential performance contracting challenge that uh, um, asks agencies to enter into um, energy savings performance contracts, $4 billion worth of energy savings performance contracts by the end of 2016. Um, we are tracking, uh, not we, but the, the national labs and the Department of Energy are tracking all the energy savings com uh, contracts across the government. So the top dots are um, 70 non-deep retrofit uh, contracts across other agencies, and then the bottom dots are, are the ones representing the GSA Deep Energy Retrofit Program. So really we are um, twice as um, aggressive in the energy reduction in our projects. So we uh, were monitoring and, and, and really um, uh, taking a close look at what is the success, what drives deep energy savings? Is it energy prices? Is it the um, original energy use index of the building, or um, is it just the age of the building or the equipments in the building? So we, uh, we had Oak Ridge National Lab uh, work with us and, and through the whole project track all these vari variables. And um, um, they were looking at um, different things. So they were tracking uh, and plotting on, um, 
on charts and graphs, the, all these variables that we thought would uh, make a difference. But what happened is we did not see a huge difference. Uh, and we really believe that the um, only differentiation from other project was uh, the GSA emphasis on the deep retrofits. Um, we communicated from the beginning through um, uh, the charrettes were um, before we even put out a notice of uh, opportunity. But um, so we communicated our need and uh, our um, um, desire to uh, achieve these deep retrofits and our willingness to accept risk, willingness to accept longer payback items. Our contract terms are 22 year long in, on, on average. Uh, we are allowed to enter into contracts up to 25 years. So we are able to uh, use this longer term contract to put in uh, energy conservation measures that has longer payback. And um, uh, we created a central uh, office um, program management office that has the core focus on energy savings performance contracts. As we heard, time is money. That was really the number one priority that the ESCO community thought that would help us uh, cut our um, costs. And um, with the program management office, we were able to reduce the award time to 15 months from about 24 months. And we believe that in our next round, we can do even better because the program management office was able to uh, set the policies and um, um, <coughs> all the defaults are now in place uh, to, to move these contracts through faster. Um, so the conclusion is that deep retrofits can be done anywhere. Um, and high energy prices, high energy consumption is, are not necessarily, um, uh, not necessary. Uh, they would help a project, as I will uh, demonstrate in uh, two case studies. And I might just call up Greg to talk about the uh, project in New Carrollton, just outside of uh, DC, uh, the IRS headquarter building. Um, Honestly, when I first toured the building, I didn't think that was the best candidate for a deep energy retrofit. Um, um, but um, it is really a success story because uh, we are cutting 60% off um, from the total energy usage of the building and 54% uh, water reduction. Um, the way um, we are achieving this is uh, putting LED lighting fixtures in the building and also in the parking garages, uh, put new control system. Um, they do have a big parking um, area around, so that allowed for um, geothermal wells. And also um, solar uh, carport structure, you'll see on the rendering there, that's a, uh, that's a new one. Greg, you can tell me what uh, the timeline <laughs> that Amoresco was the contractor for this project. Uh, I believe uh, completion is the end of this year. Another um, success story is actually a, a net zero um, building in St. Croix, um, where of course the energy cost helps the math because utility rates are like $0.54 um, per kilowatt, so um, $0.54 cents a kilowatt hour. So, um, um, and of course, uh, Lots of sunshine, and we did have an uh, um, area there um, available for um, solar panels. So in this building, um, Schneider Le Electric was um, the contractor. Uh, it's a $6.4 million um, dollar project um, implementing, um, uh, 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 putting in a new chiller, a uh, new substation, new air handlers, uh, building automation system, and then supplementing it with a uh, um, solar PV system next to the building. So uh, learning from our uh, first uh, round of deep energy retrofit projects, we are now uh, um, entered into a, a second round with about 50 buildings in four regions, um, about 20 million square feet of space. Um, some of them just right across the street here, the uh, EPA headquarter building is one of them, for example. Um, we have just finished the 
preliminary audits. So we only have projected uh, numbers at this point, um, but we are on track to be at least a 38% reduction overall or, or hopefully even higher um, as we are looking at every single opportunity in these buildings. I don't know if we're gonna make this slides available, but I just wanted to make sure there are um, links to um, the reports from our um, charrettes and also the um, best practices and um, the, the information and the lessons learned gathered um, are also available on the GSA website as well and the Rocky Mountain Institute uh, And it's my website. understanding that th this will be available. Okay, so it will yes. be useful. Okay, thank All you. Right. Harry. Yeah. Thank you, Zach. Yes. Uh, good morning. I'm Harry Sim from Cypress Enviro Systems, and um, I listened with interest to what uh, Kevin and Kinga mentioned this morning. You know, we have a big opportunity for deep retrofits to save a lot of energy in existing buildings. Part of the problem is that it costs a lot to do these. It's very invasive. You have to go in and replace big equipment. Sometimes the technology that's embedded in these te uh, buildings, they have to be replaced. So that's why it costs so much. That's why we're talking about 25-year contracts to get the payback. Well, uh, I think we want to work on the other side of the equation is how can we use technology to reduce the upfront cost so that maybe we can get faster payback. So, you know, we can get financing schemes in place to make these deep retrofit work, but can we get technology to make it less invasive, <laughs> less costly to go in and, uh, and retrofit these buildings and get a faster payback, and then you can even do more within your performance contract. Turns out uh, the uh, GSA has been very active on this area too, and we have to thank the GSA for working with uh, my company on uh, the Green Proving Ground. So they have this program, uh, the Green Proving Ground, which selects technologies to test and select the GSA facilities and really work with the DOE, Oak Ridge National Labs, to measure uh, at the performance and do, do MNV and figure out, you know, what's the savings, what's the cost, and this is a proven technology. Because as uh, both Kevin and Kinga mentioned, uh, people are risk averse. They really want to have proven technology and they want the payback and they want the savings, right? So uh, I think GSA has played a great role in this uh, green proving ground to have this kind of effort to test the technology, prove the savings, and then uh, wrap it all in the overall uh, solution then. So what I'd like to really look at is, you know, how can we get to these deep retrofits without the associated high upfront costs and high disruption that normally happens uh, to buildings. And I pick one example of a typically deep retrofit. may not seem obvious, but uh, thermostats, right? If you go into um, uh, existing buildings, a lot of them don't have digital thermostats that you can program, that you can remotely change set points, that you can do demand response. In fact, a lot of them are uh, pneumatic thermostats that work on compressed air. There's no wires, there's no data, it's all compressed air that moves dampers up and down and people have to turn the knob manually. You'll know it's pneumatic because when you turn the switch, uh, uh, there, there's a hissing sound, right? And that, that's the technology that's in use since uh, 1898 when it was invented by Johnson Controls in, in Milwaukee. And we've had this in use since up till the 1990s. And in fact, this building, uh, this Ronald Reagan building is, uh, has a lot of pneumatics. I think probably like more than half right, uh, of the building is still pneumatically controlled, even for a showcase building like this one. So uh, the, 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 the downsides is huge. You know, all the energy savings uh, type of strategies that we can extract out of buildings to turn down you know, heating or cooling when nobody's there, to adjust for peak load demand when you have high, uh, ex uh, high electricity costs, to turn down the set point so you don't have that peak, to do optimal start-stop, to do fan speed optimization. All of those things are not possible using traditional pneumatic technology because there's no way to remotely communicate and command uh, those, uh, those thermostats. And the, the, the penalty we pay for that legacy technology is in the order of 25% of energy savings. So if you compare a new digital building versus a pneumatic controlled building, it's about 25% type of difference. Uh, and that's energy, not to even mention maintenance cost. So the question is, well, how? You know, why are we living with the, all these pneumatics now? Well, 
it, it, strange as it may seem, that little thermostat in a wall is connected to a bunch of things behind a wall and in the ceiling. You can't just change the thermostat and go digital. You have to change the actuator, you know, from something that's compressed air actuated to a motor. You have to run wires both for power and for signal. Uh, the building may have asbestos in there, in which case you have to do abatement. So you try and start to get the idea that this takes a lot of effort and a lot of money, a lot of labor and materials to do, which is why the cost is so high. In fact, changing one thermostat typically just for the labor and materials alone is over $2,000 uh, average in, in the U.S. And if you add in the disruption cost of the people, People who are working in the building you have to be moved away and you know you have to then do all the work do all the abatement and have people move in you're talking a huge disruption and, and cost so that's why people don't do these uh, retrofits you know they're very uh, very costly uh, now one way to do it would possibly be to finance it over 25 years but we're trying to find a better way to do it than just have drag out you know a 25 year <coughs> financing so the uh, technology that I'd like to share with you today, which is one that went through the Green Proving Ground program, is this wireless pneumatic thermostat. It's actually not that new. It's been around now for eight years, uh, but you know, it took time for, before it got into the GSA program. This was done in 2012 when it was selected for the GSA testing, and, uh, and it's been deployed in thousands of buildings, actually. But um, basically, the whole idea is a non-invasive retrofit. Instead of taking you know, months to do, uh, 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 convert these pneumatic control systems, this takes about 10 minutes per zone. So per building, you're talking about a matter of days or weeks. I mean, in this building, we did a 150,000 square foot wing, and it took us about a week and a half to, to upgrade. Conventional technology would have been more like months, you know, four months, five months to do. Now, once you upgrade it, then you have all those benefits that you would normally associate it with digital control systems. You have the backnet connectivity with your existing automation system. You have scheduling. You have data that you can collect for occupancy, for, uh, for um, temperature, for uh, set points, uh, for branch pressure. Um, you can have alarms if something goes wrong. You can check if uh, your damper's stuck. You can check if your temperatures are too high or too low. So you have continuous commissioning capability with that. And it shrinks the time and cost by about uh, three quarters. So it usually costs like one quarter to one third the cost of conventional technology uh, to do this kind of retrofit. Now, as I mentioned, uh, this building was actually selected for the Green Proving Ground test. Uh, it's done in the Woodrow. Uh, Wilson um, um, Library, I believe, and um, there's 130 uh, pneumatic thermostats, usually about one thermostat every 800 to 1,000 square feet. That would be the rule of thumb for, for the country. And uh, we installed this uh, about two years ago, and all the data was collected and measured. There was independent gathering of data by the GSA staff who runs this building, and also uh, the an analysis of the data from Oak Ridge National Labs. So. Uh, basically, what we did was only we implemented energy saving strategies that were very simple. Um, we only did one strategy, in fact, which was to set back uh, the temperatures when nobody was in the space, right? Which is a no brainer, you know, nights and weekends. This building has central plant that runs pretty much almost 24-7 uh, because there's always people in the building doing something. So you can't completely turn off everything. So we chose. Uh, the thermostats to turn down the zones that were not being used. And by saving energy in those zones, you can keep the central plant still working. But where there are no people working and you don't need it, you can save the heating or the cooling uh, because you can turn down at that zone level. And also, it allows the building manager to see the data, you know, the temperatures and the, uh, the, um, um, the performance of each zone. So if there are problems, they can also go and fix the problems. So not only do you just get the savings from, you know, the setbacks, but you also can help you diagnose problems and do retro commissioning and ongoing commissioning. Now, it's important to mention this case study really focused on one strategy. Uh, there are other strategies that I mentioned, like uh, duct static pressure, uh, control for fans, like optimal start-stop, like auto demand response that we didn't test. We didn't want to make it too complicated, just focus on the setbacks, which setbacks you can apply to probably 90% of all the buildings in the country. So it was a good kind of baseline that we did the study on. And what um, we did, uh, taking the data from this building, the savings was on the order of about 20% to 25%. And, um, Oak Ridge National Labs took that data and they built a model 
of different regions, different types of buildings around the country and extrapolated it. So uh, there's a, we have to thank the, the PhDs and the, and the guys who build the models at Oak Ridge. But, you know, taking the weather here in Washington, D.C., and taking the, the actual results that we had, then they, apl they applied different uh, weather, you know, assumptions, different types of buildings. And basically, they found that in almost all cases, the payback was within two to six years. So the average is really around three years. We've done thousands of buildings. Average is around three-year payback, and the range is about three to six years in all the different climate zones. Now, that's for only one strategy that was tested. If we actually add other strategies on top, it shrinks the, the payback time. And if we have utility rebates, which we have in many regions, then it even shrinks it further. So you can be talking about, you know, under two-year payback for what is, quote, unquote, a deep retrofit, right? So uh, this would be really uh, quite m much more financially attractive than, than, you know, what you might normally associate with a deep uh, retrofit. So the conclusion of the project was that uh, this technology should be considered a best practice uh, for uh, all facilities that can use uh, conventional pneumatic controls. Um, I think, like Kinga said, the, the Green Proving Ground team tried to uh, uh, look at uh, which buildings made sense, which regions made sense, you know, is it a big building, little building, cold climate or not, but actually they found it really didn't matter. Wherever there were pneumatics that were used, this technology could apply. And I see that Maria, they're nodding. Yeah, yeah you got, you're part of the group. So yeah, maybe uh, if you have anything to add, please do. I think it was actually quite a revelation that you, we did this test and they ran the models and it was really good everywhere, right? Yeah, I, I, I would just emphasize the simplicity and Thank you. And Marie, you're with the Green Proving, GSA Green Proving Ground, is that right? Yeah, thank, thank you. So yeah, again, uh, I think the, it's not rocket science, it's just how to make it as easy and as low cost, low labor as possible to install. That just changes the nature of the game. It brings the cost way down, gives you the same benefits. Right? Um, this building was definitely not the first uh, uh, federal building that has been done. In fact, uh, as I mentioned, the technology has been around for eight years now. We just haven't tested it in as objectively and as detailed a way as what the GSA and uh, Oak Ridge National Labs did. But I think now, years later, you can see everywhere from, you know, Social Security to Architect at the Capitol here, the, the Ford building uh, by the mall, uh, NASA, you know, Coast Guard, a lot of, we have a lot of data in, in the public sector. And then we also have a lot of data in the private sector. Actually, uh, for the deployments of this technology, probably about two-thirds is in the private sector. Uh, you know, we, we are partnered with JLL. Uh, if you go to their booth this time, we just finished a 1.5 million square foot uh, uh, high-rise in Chicago that uh, used completely all this technology throughout the building. So I think, uh, you know, it, it, given that our industry is really tech, uh, you know, risk averse, it, it takes time to really get that data and get people comfortable. Hopefully now with all this data, with the GSA testing, we can then put it into future ESCO projects and, and really have it as, uh, as part of the standard solution. We're okay for time? Or? Yeah. Two, three minutes. Okay. Um, you know, I, I can share more about how the system is architected, but basically uh, it plugs right into your building. It's really easy to install, and then it connects with your existing building automation system. So if you have an existing investment in like a Siemens, Johnson, or Schneider, uh, it talks BACnet. This thing installs. It opens up a BACnet over IP interface, and it connects with your existing system. Your whole building is then digital, right? It used to be maybe you're, you had a digital chiller or, you know, digital control for your boiler, and now you have all digital zones, and you can now connect all of that, and you have the feedback to control all the zones and all the visibility. just enables your building to save that that much more. So it doesn't replace any technology. It actually works with existing investments that you have to leverage it to pay back more. Okay. Just some pictures of buildings, you know, low rise, high rise, old buildings, large buildings, really, again, in almost every scenario. So I think the answer is, you know, can we do deep retrofits and use technology to reduce the cost and the hassle? Absolutely yes. And this, uh, we believe, is one good example. Now, in fact, uh, for um, Cypress Enviro Systems, uh, uh, the company I, I'm with, 
Uh, that's our whole uh, emphasis, is to work on non-invasive. So there's not only pneumatics, there's steam, there's other kinds of compressed air, airflow, water flow, and there's all these old buildings that we call, you know, dumb buildings that we need to make smart. So we have a portfolio of technologies that go in and make dumb buildings smart, just like we did for the thermostats, and then we can then connect it to the, to the cloud, to the most advanced diagnostics to make the building work like a modern building, but, you know, retrofit a dumb building. Okay. Um, the next project uh, that hopefully we will actually uh, be starting in the next uh, quarter is uh, a big ESCO project with GSA in New York City. So that one is, uh, I think, about uh, 2.8 million, almost 3 million square feet. Uh, this technology is applicable for uh, two of their largest buildings there, and it would be, uh, it, it would been R reduced the cost significantly. I mean, their estimate is about uh, one third the cost of conventional technology, which will go into this total $100 million ESCO project in New York City. A uh, train is the ESCO in, in this case. So hopefully that one will start uh, it within the next, uh, you know, uh, maybe three to, to five months. Um, now, um, if you're interested in actually seeing uh, this um, technology in action, uh, we have a building tour at the end of the day. You have little cards on your chair that, uh, your seat that uh, shows the time. Uh, we have a raffle too. If you decide to join, we have a tablet for uh, folks, folks who might be lucky to, to win the tablet. But uh, uh, we have the chief, uh, the engineer of the building here, uh, Greg Dix, who's willing to give you a tour, explain you know, the ease of installation, explain the benefits since it's been installed almost two years ago, how this has worked for him, how the how the tenants have found it to be comfortable or not. So if you're interested in this, it uh, better than listening to me talk is listening to the folks who, uh, you know, have used it and they can give you their honest feedback. Uh, yep, that, that's it. So thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. All right. We have uh, just a little less than 10 minutes uh, for questions. Um, why, don't, why don't I kick it off with one? Um, in looking at the kind of the complexity around a the integrated design uh, process, uh, whole building analysis, the, the 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 various moving pieces on uh, a, a bundled portfolio uh, that you're that you're putting into an ESCO, what are the what are the pieces that you can outsource, or what are the, the components uh, that uh, a government or a company uh, needs expertise in-house uh, for either energy engineering, ESCO finance, and what is it that can be outsourced um, or put off on an owner representative uh, in order to achieve these deep energy retrofits? Well, I... The government actually does a tremendous amount of outsourcing. In GSA, 96% of what we do is actually done through private sector contracts. Um, obviously, the, 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 there's a significant value in having somebody like Kinga on the team. Um, she's a mechanical engineer, graduate degree in the same. Uh, really understands building systems, worked for uh, private sector companies doing uh, energy retrofits before she came to GSA. Incredibly valuable. Not always possible. And um, the, uh, you can, I think, with a good project, I don't think you can outsource, well, first of all, the government can't outsource the contracting function itself. It's inherently governmental. Somebody has to be willing to make those uh, financial decisions about risk. I don't think you should outsource fundamental asset management decisions. I think that's a, a huge mistake. The engineering analysis you can uh, absolutely do. These are interesting contracts because I think it's far more important to understand the um, structure of the contract, uh, the financial obligations, and the uh, way it fits in with your long-term asset strategy than it is, honestly, to understand the engineering, in part because the contracts uh, come with a guarantee. Um, and so that guarantee, uh, the, the, what we find is that our engineering expertise is usually more helpful in encouraging companies to be 
less uh, risk averse than they actually come in. The, the most stunning statistic about energy savings performance contracts is that since their beginning in the 90s in the government, uh, Oak Ridge did an analysis of all of the contracts. They overperform. That is to say, they deliver more energy savings than were promised by a factor of 100 percent, which means you're getting twice as much than the companies actually uh, guaranteed. The other uh, amazing statistic, well, and that's, that's important, too, because if you think about the theory of the contract, all of that energy savings money is going to pay back the capital investment. But if they overperform, you start getting financial benefit to your company immediately in addition to paying it back because you're going to pay back what you, you guaranteed, too. So they don't get paid back maybe as quickly, but you've got some bottom line benefits uh, showing up uh, immediately, which is really important um, in, in anybody's business. Uh, so I think a little bit of engineering and expertise, a lot of asset management expertise, and a lot of contracting expertise uh, you need to have in-house. But um, And again, it's a complex, uh, for GSA, uh, relatively large, we have it all centralized because it's a very specialized uh, way of doing and thinking. So we don't really need hundreds of that. And then you work very closely with the building operator. I mean, that's the other key component. The building operator is an absolutely the most vital person on the team other than, I would say, the contracting officer and the contractor. Okay. Oh, to leverage off of what you just said, talk about centralizing expertise. Centers of excellence. Look at suppliers in the market. Uh, I am a supplier in uh, Northwest Coast, so we supply electrical components. Is there a way or is it a benefit if you look at suppliers that are working with these EPCs to provide to GSA a model of the products that fit that type of business set in a modulized approach? Would that be a benefit that the, you could say, you know, these are products we know work? They're proven, they're, they're been used before, that kind of stuff, in a way that you can say under your GSA contracts, even your schedule, you said these are energy efficient products that are classified. Yeah, we, we actually think that is a value. We do that uh, uh, for some things. I mean, that's one of the reasons, that's one of the ways we use the green proving ground. All of that information, we sort of like put it under the noses of the energy savings company. In a lot of cases, I've spent probably 10 percent of my time talking to companies trying to figure out how better to do business with the, uh, with the government. And, you know, anybody who's in this business, I give them the list of the 16 people under the contract and say, you guys have got to talk to them. They're going to be proposing the technology and, you know, use whatever information you have, any lab reports, anything else like that. Because in a lot of cases, uh, you know, all the companies are different. I mean, you've got a controls company like uh, Johnson & Honeywell. You've got companies that are energy services companies like Amoresco. You've got people who are construction companies like uh, Clark. You've got equipment companies like Train. They're all in this, they, from, coming from a different background. And nobody knows everything. So a lot of it is sort of getting that information out for people to, uh, to look at, which is why and it was actually, I think, at one this conference here that I first met Harry and told him about the Green Proving Ground, like, what, yep. four, three, four years ago? Yeah. Four, four years ago. Years ago. So and, yeah. and you, you see the result. And now he's got a really cool business opportunity because that Wilson portion of this building is a little teeny piece of it. It's not even one tenth of the total building. Yes. Yeah. Has, has the GSA considered obviously making a lot of your existing portfolio more efficient? Have you explored opportunities to actually have fewer buildings, for building consolidation, or people? Because then there's net zero, and then there's you know net no building. So yeah. Well, yeah, the best that we, we say the best square foot uh, that you, uh, the best energy efficiency measure is the square foot that you get rid of. Um, yes, uh, we have a large government wide program doing that. We have a wonderful case study in the GSA headquarters building. 
Uh, I'd be delighted to walk you through that. It takes about 45 minutes. <laughs> So I can't do it all here, but the bottom line for the GSA headquarters building, which is sort of our example, 2,300 people moved out. We did a renovation. 4,000 people moved back in when the renovation was half finished. When the renovation is 100 percent finished, 6,000 people will be in the building. We are currently, currently, without the second half, avoiding $24 million a year in lease costs. Now, you want to talk about changing the financial picture. So this is a $165 million renovation of a building, which had to be done because the building was falling apart in many ways, hadn't been renovated since the 1930s. So, you, you know, your return on investment is there for doing a, a renovation of the building, going back to you've got to have tenants in order to make a building valuable. The $24 million added on top of that gives you a 13-year simple payback for a total gut renovation of the building. Unheard of. And believe me, it's a great place to work. I work there. Kinga works there sometimes. <laughs> and we are here today, so... Our yeah, desk, we're not there. Our desks our are empty, but somebody else is using yeah. them. I think we've got time for one more question. Beth? The owner. The owner. The, oh, for, for lease buildings, it would go into the owner. But no, these are for government-owned buildings, so the owner is the government. It goes in the government's pocket. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, no, the, I mean, it's a, it's a very elegant arrangement with the energy services company. They put up a bunch of capital. They get paid for the work that they do in the building, like any construction company. They get paid for the use of the capital, like any financing company, and they get a little profit. Anything over and above goes right back to the building owner, whether it's a private sector person or a, uh, or a government entity. And that 100% uh, is, you know, it's of two components. It's the, the, the government contributes uh, its risk-averse estimate of what the um, – energy cost escalation is going to be, so we underestimate that just to be safe. And the companies underestimate the performance of their technologies because they're putting up a guarantee just to be safe. So you get, you know, between those two factors, they account for almost all of the 100 percent. Excellent. Well, I think that is our time. Uh, thank you all again. Thank you to the panelists.